This episode of the Lutheran Cartographer is brought to you by the Ron Paul Homeschool Curriculum. If you're looking for a good curriculum, check it out at lutherancartographer.com slash homeschool. The Lutheran Cartographer, episode 33. Welcome to the Lutheran Cartographer, the podcast where we explore what it's like to be Lutheran in different places. I'm your host, Nicholas Weber. Today we are joined by Pastor Will Wheaton. He is the assistant pastor of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Hamill, Illinois. He is also the catechist on The Word of the Lord Endures Forever and has written several books for CPH, including Celebrating the Saints and Thank, Praise, Serve, and Obey, Recover the Joys of Piety. Pastor Wheaton, welcome to the show. Thank you. A joy to be with you, Nicholas. So tell us a little bit about where we are geographically. Um, are we in the St. Louis metro? Where exactly are we? Uh, if you think of the St. Louis metro as bordered by the uh, interstates, then we're just outside of the St. Louis metro. Um, it, 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 Hamill is located right on Highway 55 and right on Old Route 66, uh, exactly 30 minutes uh, well, on Highway 55, it's exactly 30 minutes, uh, from the Poplar Street Bridge, which is where you cross over into Missouri. So it's it's right about maybe 10 minutes away from the, I, 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 we don't really call it the Beltway here, but 270. It's a Beltway around St. Louis. So uh, it's it's about 10 minutes out from that. In the middle of a lot of uh cow pastures and cornfields and soybean fields and uh, the occasional wheat field. Excellent. So you're really kind of right on the edge of kind of where it's more suburban to where it's more rural then? Right. And in fact, the little village of Hamel has become much more of a, a bedroom community than it had been previously. Uh, true also for the town to our south, which is a college town, uh, Edwardsville. Okay. Tell our listeners, they're, most of them are quite familiar with you, but tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in Hamill. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay. I came to Hamill first as a seminarian. Um, I had gone to college in Bronxville, New York. And when I came to the seminary, I happened to run across at the seminary a friend that I had known from Bronxville. Um and, or at least I shouldn't say a friend, it was a name that I knew from Bronxville. <laughs> um, he had actually graduated before I did. He said, oh, you need to go out to Hamill to do your field work. And I'm like, where's that? And uh, uh, he, he sent me uh, out toward uh, Hamill. And I went and asked Dale Meyer, who at the time was the uh, placement director for uh, resident field education, and said, hey, any chance I can go out to, uh, to Hamill to do my field work? And he was like, what? Why would you want to go there? Okay, well, sure. My my friend Wally is the pastor there. I'll I'll arrange it. And so I ended up at Hamill as a field worker for a couple years uh, before Vicarage. Uh, when I came back from Vicarage, I went there quite a bit, and the pastor at the time had changed. It was uh, Pastor uh, Wally Dressler who he and his wife were just so hospitable. They had us over so often. We enjoyed lots of beer in there <laughs> after the service in their living room. It was really wonderful. Um, and then I took a call to uh, North Carolina and served there for six years. When I got a surprise phone call and then, you know, one evening, and uh, I still remember, I, you know, going to the phone in the kitchen, those were the days phones were attached to walls, you know. Um, and, and, and the... It, it, it was from the circuit counselor out here who said, you've just been elected the pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Hamill, Illinois. I was like, really? I mean, I had no, 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 no idea. There was no interview, no anything like that. I guess, you know, they, they knew me as a field worker. They didn't feel the need to interview. And so they, uh, they did call me and I served there for almost 20 years before going to serve the uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Senate as the director of worship. I did that for about eight years and then uh, uh, retired from that position and came back to Hamill as, a, as an assistant pastor. But my real full-time job is uh, working with Lutheran Public Radio as a 
the, the catechist for the word of the Lord endures forever. Excellent. And we'll definitely have you say more about that towards the end of the podcast. Before you went to Concordia, Bronxville, where where did you grow up? Yeah, my family, <laughs> this is complicated. My family is actually Virginian. Both of my parents are from the same very small village, uh, Richardsville, Virginia. And after World War II, they moved to Maryland, and that's where they raised us. And yet, if they used the word home, we always knew what that meant. That was not Maryland. That was going back to Richardsville. Um, and after my dad died, he died when I was uh, uh, 19 years old, my mom and uh, my sister and her family, they all moved back to Richardsville together. Um, so Richardsville kind of is how my family thinks of home. But we lived for a long time in Wheaton, Maryland. Um, and so I, I, it's funny because I was raised in Maryland. I talk more like people from Maryland and less like my parents talked from from Virginia. Um, and and if you're on the East Coast and become a Lutheran or find Lutheranism there, the, the college for the East Coast, if you will, for the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate was Concordia Bronxville. So that's how I ended up at Concordia Bronxville. Yeah, we talked to Pastor Nauman, who's uh, the pastor in Scarsdale, New York, which I think is just a hop, skip, oh, and yeah. jump from, yeah. <laughs> just up from it. Yeah. yeah. We used to eat there all the time. <laughs> Excellent. So how would you compare and contrast the other places you've been with Hamill, either for good or for ill? Oh, boy. To compare and contrast. Well, I mean, I've mostly lived my life in suburbia, um, usually close to a, a major metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect most Americans are, are in that, that grouping. Um, so Hamill is a more rural than I was used to. When we first moved here, the, uh, there were still a number of dairies in the area and the smell of the cows was quite strong. You know, if you had the windows open, you could smell it you know, the, the nice stuff they put on the fields to make it grow. As uh, one of my members told me a long time ago, Pastor, that's the smell of money. And I'm like, man, does money stink? <laughs> so, my mother that, calls it country was, perfume. <laughs> country perfume. I love it. So that's, you know, uh, it, it was a very different area that way. Um, it was also a non, a typically non-integrated area back then, Um I, I had always in, in Maryland, uh, you know, it had always been uh, racially integrated and and and, and you know, n not just with black and white, but with um, uh, all kinds of Asians and Hispanics. I mean, that that, that Washington, D.C. area is a t tends to be rather cosmopolitan that way. Um, and this was like not like that at all. <laughs> this was you know, very, uh, very, very white area mm -hmm. when, when we moved here. It's not quite so much anymore. Um, and uh, that, that, that's been a, a change over time to, to see uh, people move in. Uh, but our, our church is still predominantly, uh, well, I think it's exclusively right now, um, uh, uh, Caucasian, white. I see. So tell us about the best things about Hamill. The best things about Hamill. Well, it was a great, it really is a great place to raise kids because it's just a small little village and you do tend to know a lot of people. Originally, there were only two churches in Hamill. They put the Lutheran Church two miles to the north. They put the UCC, United Church of Christ Church, two miles to the south. Um, and then there was the little village itself. For a very long time, Hamill actually, I mean, our church actually ran a school in the town of Hamill, as well as the one located on the church property. Because it's so small and everybody knows each other, it's, it tends to be a very friendly place. Um, you, you, you do, uh, it's, not, it's not friendly like the South is friendly, you know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's Midwest friendly. It's, it, it, it's a little, a little more different more distant than the way that down, you know, down in North Carolina, man, <laughs> if you barely knew someone, you could still carry on a 20 minute conversation and the checkout, the express checkout line, you know? <laughs> uh, but not, that's not the way it is here, but, but they're still, it's, it's very friendly, very, very open. And, 
it is also predominantly uh, the area tends to be predominant historically was predominantly German and it was also predominantly Lutheran or Catholic. Um, the Catholics mostly in the larger city nearby and the, um, the Lutherans out in the country in the villages. Okay. But I mean, now, now we, we have a Baptist church now in town. Um, and, uh, the only church in the bounds of Hamble, by the way. Um, and it's still just a great, great place to live. I love that we raised our kids here and that there was never any sense of, um, of anything they needed to worry about. I mean, the, if it was a great place. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. So would we kind of sum it up as saying that the things that you like best about Hamill is that it had this small ap town atmosphere or even rural atmosphere that really made it, as you were just saying, very family friendly and a wonderful place to, to raise children? Yeah, and, and I'd, I'd add that, you know, it, it's probably part of my own shaping is because home was always that Richardsville thing, the, the little, you know, country, you know, my parents, my, both grandparents lived on farms. So I, I don't breathe easy in a city. If I'm around a lot of people, I, it is always tension for me. I, I get really nervous and I don't like it. And when I get, as soon as I'm beyond the bound of the city, I'm like, ah, oh, I can breathe again and out in the country. So that's to raise our kids in that felt fabulous. That was where I just felt most at home. That makes sense. So let's talk about the the flip side of the coin. We've talked about mm -hmm. the good things. What are some of the challenges about being in Hamill? Oh, boy. I, I suspect most of the challenges are going to be in the... They're challenges to people who are more social than I am. So you're a little bit away from the action out here. I mean, my, my kids would sometimes as they're growing up protest that, right? You know, there's nothing to do. And I go, isn't it glorious? There's nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, they're, they're like, you know, the, but, but they're, you know, no concerts. And I mean, none of that kind of stuff going on. Uh, you have to, you have to drive to it, but it's not far away. Um, so you, you are a little bit away uh, from, from the action. There's certainly a lot of action just eight miles to the south in Edwardsville. And St. Louis is only 30 minutes away. So, you, you know, you do have a lot of opportunities there. But Hamill is is remote. No, no question about that for the metro area. And and funny, I mean, eight miles to Edwardsville. But people in Edwardsville say, oh, you live way out in Hamill. Huh? <laughs> it's like, yeah, way, way out there. It's interesting how people have a different sense of space the older a, a community is. I, I, yeah. 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 That makes sense. Okay. So let's talk Let's talk about what it's like to be Lutheran in Hamill. I know that you're very close to St. Louis, and people think of St. Louis as just this um, Lutheran mecca. What What is it like being Lutheran in Hamill? Um, it, it, there was a time that literally everybody in town was pretty much, you were either a rank heathen or you were a member of St. Paul's or you were a member of Emmanuel, the UCC church. And that was pretty much it. Um, nowadays it's not like that. Of course we have our fair share of nuns too, um, in, in this area, it definitely happens, but we still have, well, let me put it this way to the house, to my South, that's going to be where our new teacher and her husband lived. She's a uh, classical ed teacher, and he's a retired pastor, um, served much of his ministry there in, in Nebraska, right in the Wyoming district, right on the little part that, that touches. And then to the, to the north is my father-in-law. If I look across the way, I see where uh, Deaconess uh, Sandra Bowers and her husband, Matt, live. And, oh, we have members right around the corner that are uh, um, uh, the matters. They're, they're there. And if I look out my back door, uh, Jeff Schwartz's brother and his wife live there and with their kids. They're three sweet kids. And then if I go look a little further, I can see uh, several of our members on the next road. Does that give you an idea? It definitely <laughs> I mean, does. Yeah, I mean, it is a little Lutheran community by and large. 
so the big thing about being Lutheran here is you're not lonely. You yeah. know, um, I mean, literally, it, it, and that's just this little quadrant of Hamill. If you go on the other side, there's more. So, yeah, that that is really wonderful to be able to have those like-minded people that you can really be in community and communion with right by you. At I yeah. One of the challenges that uh, Pastor Golden, who's on the other side of the river at Village Lutheran Church, mentioned about being Lutheran in the area is that it was very easy to become sort of overly absorbed in uh, synod politics. Do you find that over in Hamill, or are you far enough away that that is, isn't really a concern? Well, you know, our pastor, our, our senior pastor is the sixth vice president of Senate. OK, <laughs> so, you know, and, and I worked at the International Center and a lot of the people in our congregation over the years have worked at the International Center. So uh, Senate politics is is big. And Hamill actually has a strong role in that. And in, in, in the difficulties in the in the 1970s, this congregation was staunch and a leader in, uh, you know, what, what people uh, call the battle for the Bible. They, they really did get into that and were very concerned about the direction of their church body. Um, and in fact, that, that they were part of the group that helped turn, turn it around. So in that sense, Hamill has always sort of had an outsized uh, synodical political thingy going on if that makes any sense yeah that makes sense yeah i think that and it sounds like that is for good i think what uh pastor golden was articulating was just that the challenges of um uh perhaps being not focused enough on your own church and uh, seeing the people around you rather than thinking about synod, but it sounds like Hamill is perhaps not as caught up in that or not as prone to that. Sure. I mean, I think because of the distance that actually helps a little bit. I mean, we are, if, if we are just beyond that boundary to, to on this side, if you go catty corner all the way across the Metro St. Louis and just inside the beltway boundary, if you will, that's where the International Center is. So they're, they're a long trip away, um, even though, like I said, it's a bedroom community and we had a lot of people over the years that worked there. In fact, you know, the, the director of the current director of worship for the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, um, Pastor Sean Dan Dancer is a member of St. Paul's. The current editor of the Lutheran Witness is a member of St. Paul's. Um, so you 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 get the the idea that it's it's actually a um, you know again outsized in its importance given how small the congregation it, well I mean it's not small for for given the area I mean we're a congregation of of just I think we I don't even know what we are anymore probably seven seven hundred seven fifty something like that baptized um, but in this area that's not big that's solidly a middle sized congregation. You know, just down the road, I think it's 1800 and then only in maybe uh, another five miles uh, to the west. I think there's a congregation of, of 18 or 20 uh, or 2000. And then there's two that are that size down in Collinsville, which is just another 20 minutes down the road. It's just it it, it, it is a Lutheran Mecca in that sense. There are a lot of us here. I, you know, one of the it really showed up with for us with our kids. Um, all, all three of our children are married to, to Lutherans. Now, my youngest daughter married a Wells Lutheran, but he's become LCMS. Um, but the older two, uh, married Lutheran, LCMS Lutherans. My daughter had to go to Seward to meet her husband. You know, now she lives up in Wisconsin. He's a pastor up there. Um, and my son, he met his, uh, his wife working at, at the local, uh, office max. Uh, that, that's where they met. And uh, her, her dad, for a long time, was a pastor, not the pastor, the uh, president of the parish to our south, the larger parish to our south. Um, so lots of Lutherans. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It sounds like a good place to find Lutheran community there. Yeah, definitely. Let's take a moment for a word from our sponsor. At this time, a lot of parents and grandparents are considering keeping their children at home when the government schools open back up in the fall, and I would encourage you to do the same. 
If you're looking for a curriculum, I would recommend checking out the Ron Paul Homeschool Curriculum. This will teach your children well how to live in the left-hand kingdom with classes in business, natural sciences, as well as college prep, in addition to all the usual subjects that you would expect from any curriculum, such as mathematics and history. Best thing about this curriculum is that it is self-directed after the third grade, so you don't have to pull your hair out trying to stay a step ahead of your children in the curriculum. If you're interested, I'd recommend checking it out at lutherancartographer.com slash homeschool. That's lutherancartographer.com slash homeschool. Let's get back to our guest. Let's talk next about what it's like to raise a family there. You've already talked about what a wonderful atmosphere it was, this more rural place, a place to breathe a little better. Say a little bit more about what it was like to, to raise your children in that area. Well, it really was a blessing because especially at that time, our, our Lutheran schools were were ticking along pretty strongly. So, I mean, the kids were in sports. You basically, the Lutherans and the Catholics, again, had, um, we played each other in sports all the time. But there were enough Lutheran and Catholic schools all around that uh, you, could, you could do that. That sort of, that situation is changing as the Lutheran schools continue to struggle. Um, you know, they're, a lot of Lutherans don't have a lot of children anymore. A lot of Catholics don't either. And that really causes a bit of a crisis in the schools. But I just got to throw this out there. I mean, I, I want to go back right now. I want to go back to kindergarten because at St. Paul's, we have this unbelievable classical Christian education school. Where, I mean, this kid, my granddaughter is learning violin like right from the start. That's what part of what they do. Cantor Muth. I'm like, oh, my goodness. How did we end up with Cantor Muth here? It's unbelievable. And. The, the school, I, I can't praise highly enough all of the faculty, especially, you know, um, our, our, our principal, Kate Telke. She's just been phenomenal in, in dealing with this. And, and actually, the one who helped set us on this track is Deaconess Lynn Fredrickson, who I now work with at Lutheran Public Radio. It's absolutely, if I, if I were living, if, if I had kids, well, I mean, in fact, this, is, this happens. People move to Hamill to go to St. Paul's, to send their kids to St. Paul Lutheran School now. And because there they know they're going to get a real education. Um, it's going to be the kind of education that's grounded in the in solid scripture and uh, and the confessions. They have chapel every single day. They're, they have Eucharist um, on Wednesdays. It, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful place for kids to grow up. And it was really, it was a great place also for my kids too. It, there were a lot of challenges. We were trying to do a joint school at the time and we had not yet committed to a classical model, um, much to my sadness. But as, as time went on, it just became really clear. No, we just need to do this. We need to make our school be a classical education school. And uh, that was awesome for raising the, the, you know, raising the kids to have the Lutheran ed have so much influence on them. So my kids went to Lutheran preschool, to Lutheran grade school, to Lutheran high school. We also have a Lutheran high school right down the road in Edwardsville. Um, and my oldest daughter went to Lutheran college, too. So you get the you get the idea. <laughs> Excellent. So a lot of our uh, the people that we've had on this podcast have mentioned classical Lutheran education in passing. And I think I've done a disservice to my listeners to not dive in a little bit and tell those that might not be aware, what exactly is classical Lutheran education? Uh, it's built on this ancient uh, way of learning uh, called the trivium, uh, trivium, in which you have... Uh, it, it recognizes that in every single discipline of learning, there is a, a, a grammar stage, a logic stage, and a rhetoric stage. Um, so basic, if you think about grammar for history, grammar for history is you learn the dates and the timelines. And there is an age at which these little lines are nothing but sponges. And you can literally dump all that info in, and they have no trouble assimilating it and spitting it right back out. And you do that in every single area that you're working on in school. Um, there is you, you find out what is what is the grammar of this? What is and once they know the grammar, they get that down. Then they move to actually being able to work with it a little bit. That's the logic stage, you know. So what 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 do you? 
it's a deeper understanding. And then you move beyond that deeper understanding to them being able to express things in the rhetoric stage, um, to actually speak out and be articulate about the, um, the various subjects that they've been learning. And you can sort of see what the, I mean, if, you, if, if a Lutheran says, I'm not sure what that's really all about, just read the preface to the large catechism. Luther lays it out there. He's like, okay, first teach them these texts and you need to lean, you know, the, you're going to dump into these kids' heads, the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the um, words of institution of baptism and the sacrament of the altar. And then after you get those down and they can recite them backwards, forwards and sideways, then you teach them the meanings and you don't change the word of the meaning. You just, you know, get that in there, too. But that's move. That's moving into a, a gra- um, in the, uh, from grammar to a logic stage. Once you're done with that, then you move into the larger catechism and you just expound its meaning wide open, which is what uh, the large catechism is all about. So if you can think of the Lutheran uh, large catechism, you actually have classical Christian education at work in how Luther wrote and shaped the, the catechetical materials to work together. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for defining that for us. Let's now move to a part of the podcast that I really look forward to, and that's asking you, what are some of your favorite things to do or to see in the area? If a friend's coming into town, where would you take them to eat? What activities would you recommend? What would you recommend to our listeners if they're in the the St. Louis Hamill area? Okay, you know, let me preface this by, I'm going to give you some of what I think are standard answers. My answer would be, why don't you come to my house and we'll enjoy a glass of wine and we'll have a meal together and we won't have to go anywhere. And that will be heaven on earth. Um, so, I mean, I am I am almost reclusive in, in, in these things. So I bear that in mind. But there are some neat things in the areas. And really not far down the road from us is the Cahokia Mounds which it gets tends to get overlooked, but it was the largest Mississippian Indian um, civilization, uh, center of civilization uh, in this, in North America. I mean, it was, it was huge, right? And so uh, visiting that has a great museum and, and uh, it's kind of sad in, in recent years, our local, we call it Mount Trashmore, um, our local landfill is only a few miles away and it's gotten much higher <laughs> but the Indian mounds themselves are are well worth visiting. Of course, all the Lutheran sites. Um, I'm thinking not just of visiting uh, uh, the inter- you know, international center is a great place to visit. There's a museum there from the uh, 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 Concordia Historical Institute, and there's one also in at Concordia uh, Seminary campus. Concordia Seminary is absolutely a, a, a architectural masterpiece and a joy to visit and uh, do things there. CPH, you got to go to CPH. You know, where else are you going to buy Whedon's books, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, they, they got a lot of a lot of good stuff there. That, that's always a, a, a fun trip in, in the area. Anheuser-Busch is right there. If you're a beer person, um, they have a nice beer garden. Um, you can also visit, uh, I mean, places to eat that I really love. Uh, it, it it's not very Lutheran, but uh, th- th- there is a great Irish place downtown, um, which, whose name is escaping me right now. Why can't I think of that? It's it's not far from Stuart. It's uh, um, um, I'll see if I can look it up and send it to you. But uh, just a great place to uh, enjoy. If you like fish and chips and that kind of stuff, they have their their choice there, and they have live Irish music several nights a week, or. At least they did before this whole thing. I, I'm assuming that they're sort of back since some of the, you know, some of the area you could eat outside and you can eat inside now, I think, in some areas of St. Louis, too. Um, and uh, boy, other places, obviously, you know, if you haven't done the arch, you should do it once in your life. I would never recommend doing it more than once. Um, <laughs> it's not that interesting. You get a great view of the muddy Mississippi crawling by you. Um, and uh, there are other little, you know, Lutheran sites. If you're interested in the Missouri Synod's peculiar history, there's um, you, you can just travel right outside of the St. Louis area to the to the south, either in Illinois or in Missouri, and find some um, uh, interesting history there. 
I see. Thank you for those recommendations. Before we move into the closing part of our podcast where I ask you to plug the things that share with your listeners what you'd like to and then give your final thoughts, before we go there, I really want to briefly stop on the coronavirus situation. How are things there and where are you guys at with, with that? We just started. Um, we started church back at the beginning of June. Praise God. Yeah, we were we were going crazy. Um, we've had internet church offered throughout the whole time, but you know, <laughs> we've been dying for the sacrament. Beginning in May, we started communing um, individual families that would care to. They would come to church, and we would have an abbreviated service. Um, and then, beginning in June, uh, we had two weeks of spoken liturgy, um, and then we felt okay. We we're going to go ahead and, and bump this up to a sung liturgy. So we have our regular divine service without, um, I mean, the only hymn we sing is the hymn of the day. We don't kneel for communion. We, you know, people come in, in, in a line. They're supposed to stay six feet distant, but sometimes that's, you know, <laughs> you can't control what people do very well. Um, and the, the, the chalice is um, is still the most popular option for receiving the Lord's blood. Um, we use fortified wine and a purificator that's been dipped in Everclear to uh, wipe the the rim. And it's it. I was just really happy to see that our people did not shy away from the chalice in this time. And let me put this in perspective. Our our I think in our county the actual rate has been like. Point zero zero three percent infection rate and point zero 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 two for death rate. I mean, just really low. Our zero I mean our zip code has not had any happen. So, um, you know, uh, we're still being cautious. We still we have people sometimes that are, uh, you know, they're in masks. That's perfectly great. We have no problem with that. Um, but we are trying to move toward normality um, as we move into the, um, the rest of the summer and the fall. Right now, our liturgies are running at five services a weekend to keep the numbers 50 or below in the building, which is way under. Uh, I mean, like the building can easily do 300 people. So that's they're spread out pretty far with that. Okay, good deal. So now before we close, I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to talk about some of the things that you're doing. And I want to encourage our listeners to check out The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. I've been greatly blessed by it. It's a verse-by-verse Bible study, but I don't want to steal your thunder about it. Why don't you tell our listeners about it and why it's so great and why they should be listening to it? Ah. I have to confess that when Jeff floated, Jeff Schwartz floated this idea by me, I thought, why would anybody want to listen to that? Um, and uh, it, it, he says, we don't have any Lutheran expository preaching. Uh, I, I think we need this. We need to be, and we can't let the Reformed own this. It is the church's historic way of preaching, actually. Um, if you pick up a sermon by St. John Chrysostom or Augustine, whatever, that's how they tended to go. You know, verse by verse by verse by verse. Then they would comment on it. Um and uh, so I thought, okay, let's let, let's let's give it a shot and see what happens. And uh, I've had a blast. I I just have loved digging into it so far. Um, we started out with John, which you just you know start out at the top, I guess. Um, and then we went to Hebrews, and we're in. I'm in the middle of uh, not not the middle. I'm finishing up Romans, and then we're going to go to Matthew. So it's been amazing and fun. And we just read. It's, it's no more than 15 minute podcast, right? 15 minutes. And usually every once in a while, there's something that needs to be said a little more. Um, and sometimes it's a little shorter. But the idea is that I aim at about 2000 words, more or less for, for the podcast. And uh, being able to just do nothing but exposit scripture has been to me like 
this is this is like I'm I'm living the dream, man. I'm living the dream. I'm so excited about it. Um, and the, working through text that way is a different experience. Something that as a Lutheran pastor. I mean, I did in Bible class. I did that in Bible class. But I'm actually, I mean, think of them more as, I would call it a Bible study, but it's really more of little sermons working through the texts. Um, and I, 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 I've loved it. It's, it's just been awesome for me. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend listeners check that out. There will be a link in the show notes page to do that. Please check it out. It's a wonderful podcast. Now, before we close, what are some of the thing, other things that you would like to tell our listeners about that you're doing or have done? Oh, my goodness. I'm not sure. I, I'm actually a pretty boring person, man. Um, so I, 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 I am working on several writing projects right now. But uh, um, I do have uh, beginning, I think, in July, um, once a month, I should have um, an article appearing on the web version of Lutheran Witness, that'll be free. Um, several of us are writing those. Wolf Miller, I think, uh, plus, I can't remember who the other writers are. There's, uh, um, I think there might be a woman or two in there as well that are writing. So it's, oh, um, it's it. I think maybe uh, Adrian Hines, um, who used to be the Lutheran Witness editor. Um, so that that's a, uh, a lot of fun and looking forward to that. Um, and I just basically keep on working on my own writing stuff. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. What are your parting thoughts for our listeners? Well, you know what I, I would, I would hope all of them would do would see that even though we are in very different geographic areas, this confession that binds us together, which we celebrated this, this, this past week, we celebrated 490 years of the Augsburg confession. It is such a joyous and such a beautiful confession that it has produced a community of folks, of Christians, that have held together as a church for, for all these years. And I believe it's going to continue. Um, and, and I'd urge everyone, study those precious confessions, read them in conjunction with your Bible, and proudly be Lutheran. Or, it's, you know, higher things like to say, dare to be Lutheran. Um, I, I, I am utterly convinced that everybody wants to be a Lutheran. They just don't know it yet. So it's our job to help them get it. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you again. God's peace. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks for listening to The Lutheran Cartographer. I want to go back and mention that that Irish pub that Pastor Whedon mentioned earlier is John D. McGurk's Irish Pub and Garden on Russell Boulevard. And you can find all that stuff that he mentioned as well as that pub at the show notes page at lutherancartographer.com slash 33. So check that out for all the great resources that Pastor Whedon mentioned today, as well as links to the word of the Lord endures forever. Again, a great verse-by-verse -verse Bible study that I highly recommend that you check out. Also want to mention that you can subscri subscribe to the show on iTunes or on Stitcher so you don't miss an episode. And while you're there, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave me a rating and a review. That way more people can find this podcast. And if you're in the market for a curriculum this coming fall, if you're not in Hamill and not able to attend the classical Lutheran school, I recommend you check out the Ron Paul curriculum. That's at lutherancartographer.com slash homeschool. Until next time. I'm Nicholas Weber. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon.